quote, as they say, uh, from the cockpit at the beginning of a flight that you are in the correct room for a discussion about the uh, struggle against the neoliberal agenda in healthcare unions. Healthcare unions are in this unique uh, position to take on this fight both in defense of the healthcare quality for their patients and also in their own defense of the labor standards and aspirations of workers. And that was the genesis for this panel. So um, my name is Ellen David Friedman. Um, I am a retired union organizer from Vermont and on the policy committee of Labor Notes. And I am delighted to see a former esteemed Labor Notes colleague and a current member of our uh, editorial staff and writing staff, Al Bradbury. If anybody is not yet familiar with Labor Notes, there is no good reason for that. Um, the Um, so the reason that Labor Notes is uh, hosting this particular discussion, is that? Yeah, please. The reason that uh, Labor Notes is interested in um, hosting this particular discussion is because uh, we in our project and our networks represent that whole of the labor movement that recognizes that in order to fight the fight and win anything against the boss, you must be able to have a union in which the members are not only empowered, but educated, encouraged, helped, and supported to become militant actors on their own behalf through a form of kind of rank and file democratic unionism. That if you don't have that, if you instead are trying to win victories or concessions against the boss in a model of union which is top down, which is excessively bureaucratic, which has relationships that are more transactional with the boss, relationships between elites, which has come to characterize, unfortunately, many of our unions, then you will not be capable of actually mounting and winning those fights. So these two twin objectives of winning a democratic union and then using the power of that union to win not only gains, of course, for your own members, but gains in society at large, which the labor movement has always had to do. It has always been our mission to try and do that. It has to start with this question of rank and file militant union democracy. And so for this panel, uh, we invited uh, two outstanding representatives of that trend within the healthcare sector, um, the second of whom will join us soon. And we will begin with the first. But uh, these, these two trends, the two invitations were issued for this reason. Sal Rosselli, who is here, some of you may know or know of. Uh, Sal was the president of United Healthcare Workers West, I think the second largest, perhaps, as you know, local in the country, representing 150,000 healthcare workers in California that was committed to the maintaining of high standards for their workers, fighting the social fight for expanded and accessible and high quality health care for patients um, and ended up on a path in which they came into irreconcilable differences with their national union. Uh, some of you know, some of you were shoulder to shoulder uh, with them in the fight in 2008 when they were trusteed by SEIU and then the leadership uh, of UHW which had been deposed as you will no doubt here in more detail from Sal, uh, took the audacious and necessary, uh, in that case, the necessary step of saying, we cannot expect to win the fight for union democracy within SEIU. That is not going to be possible. They're going to crush, they have crushed that effort. So instead, we are going to try and build an independent union outside of the SEIU and win back our members. And that is part of the story that you are going to hear today. This is almost unheard of in our current labor movement. There's a lot of debate about whether or not this is a good tactic, a good strategy. Uh, some of us believe that it is 
um, shown, uh, as they say, kind of the audacity um, of courage that we don't see that often, which was to try something uh, which is virtually unknown with our labor movement. So Sal will be able to tell us about that story. And our other speaker who we are waiting for is a woman named Judy Chardon Gonzalez. Again, some of you may know her. She is a nurse and has been a, continues to be a, a practicing clinical nurse um, and is now the vice president of the New York State Nurses Association, NISNA, an independent nurses union. Um, I don't actually know their membership. Maybe somebody here does. I don't know. Hmm? 37,000. Thank you. And um, so the the path that was taken in NISNA is uh, closer to, more similar to the kinds of reform strategies um, that have been followed in many other unions, perhaps most notably by TDU, the Temp Teamsters for Democratic Union, which is to try and raise issues within your union, substantive issues, both on collective bargaining, uh, methods within the union, decision making within the union, other social issues such as healthcare policy, and then to build an internal caucus, a reform caucus, to challenge incumbent leadership, and through that to um, move closer to a position of leadership where you can then shape the future direction of the union. And that is the nice story that we will hear from Judy when she arrives. So, um, without further ado, it is a great, uh, it's a great pleasure and privilege to introduce Sal Roselli to give you the background of NUHW's struggle. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks very much. It's, uh, it really is a pleasure to be here, and I think it's a, it's a sad commentary you know, on, our, on our labor movement today that Labor Notes needs to host a discussion like this, um, where uh, you know, our approach to organizing and representing workers, uh, internal union democracy is fundamentally important to you know, mobilizing, educating workers uh, to struggle, right, um, is, is normal for us. Um, when we uh, hooking up with social uh, justice movements, you know, is a normal part of that. Hard bargaining, uh, the willingness to strike, right, for workers to achieve their goals is a normal thing. Uh, every single one of our contract campaigns, the first thing we do is, once we democratically elect uh, leaders, is put together a plan with folks that ultimately threatens a strike with their employer because that's obviously that's the strongest position uh, to win their goals most often without a strike, but even times you know, strikes are, are necessary. Um, that's how uh, our union in California achieved the highest standards for uh, hospital workers in the country and the greatest voice you know, for, for their patients of anywhere else. Um, you know, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the industry, uh, because in these times, you know, the global recession, calls for austerity, the healthcare uh, industry in this country is using that, you know, to accomplish takeaways, you know, from from their workers, and it's uh, we're in a period of history where the hospital industry, both for profit and non profit, are more profitable than ever. Okay, more profitable than ever. A recent study found that uh, the five largest publicly traded health insurance companies in the country had their most profitable year uh, last year in a decade. Uh, UniHealth, uh, United Health, by example, their profits increased 11% to $1 billion last year. Kaiser Permanente, which is the largest nonprofit health system in the country, uh, is our greatest story. Had profits of $8.9 billion, with a B, billion dollars uh, since 2019. In fact, the first three months of this year, they've uh, achieved a profit of $8.5 million every day. Uh, HCA, the largest for profit uh, hospital chain in the country, their profits went up 70% last year. Their, their share price uh, increased 30% from the first three months of this year. Uh, and, and finally, a report from Price Waterhouse Coopers concludes that under Obamacare, um, the insurance industry in this country, uh, with a new lucrative market, um, are expected to gain up to $200 billion in new revenue by 2019. 
So that's, that's the state of affairs for the healthcare industry, right? And as always, you know, with both profit and non-profit corporations, uh, that amount of profit is not enough. So uh, with, again, the smokescreen of the global recession and with the, um, the absolute coordination of SEIU and some other national unions, uh, they're demanding huge takeaways from their uh, employees and they're, they're achieving them. Elimination of defined benefit pensions, elimination of employer, full employer paid health care, uh, wage freezes, speeding up of work. Yeah. I'm going to see. You can move closer and you can speak louder and then ask them to be quiet. I'll try. 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 Base compensation of nine million dollars, and like uh, many of his colleagues, enjoyed eight separate pension plans each. Right, this is the head of a nonprofit corporation. Uh, so let me just tell you a little bit about NUHW and who we are and, and how we came into being. As Ellen mentioned, the leaders of our union, both officers, staff, member leaders. Uh, we're the leaders of SCIU, United Healthcare Workers West in California. Um, me for 25 years, some of my colleagues for 35, 40 years. And over our careers, um, again, achieved the, we were the fastest growing union inside SCIU in terms of new organizing. In fact, over a six year period in the late 90s, beginning of this century, organized 60,000 hospital workers. And equally as important, achieved uh, these high standards that we've accomplished through these decades of struggle in California. Uh, standard contracts that all workers have a defined benefit pension plan. Fully employer paid health care for not only them, but their dependents and spouses. Uh, a real voice in staffing levels, uh, which means uh, joint committees. Uh, with third-party arbitration to disagreements on staffing levels. In 2006, hi, welcome to you. Hi, no, no, no. It's a big Welcome, we're just starting. Uh, in 2006, we accidentally uh, found out that the top leadership of SEIU, led by Andy Stern in Washington, D.C., uh, was bargaining uh, these transactional deals with the for-profit nursing home industry and hospital industry. And these transactions were in exchange for economic relief for these employers in California, compromising the standards that our workers achieved. Uh, they would have organizing rights with these corporations in other states like Texas and Florida. So in exchange for economic standards in California, growth for SCIU, without worker involvement, top-down secret deals. Uh, we very constructively, internally, over a, a couple of year period, stopped it. We didn't allow it to happen, and I, and I want to remind you again, we're the fastest growing union, so it's not like uh, we're not doing a, a tremendous amount of, of new organizing. Um, that uh, was unacceptable to SCIU, and the reason why it was fundamentally important for them to get control of California is because uh, all, all national corporations, like Kaiser, like HCA, Tenet, the Catholics, the membership base of SCIU in these national corporations is all in California. So they needed control of this union to be able to continue these tra transactional deals nationally. In January of 2009, SCIU gave us an ultimatum. And that ultimatum was twofold. One, we would have agreed to transfer 60,000 of our members out of our union and into a corrupt union led by a, an appointee of Andy Stern without a vote. And the reason for that was to weaken us, right? Uh, decrease our resources. And secondly, we had to agree that bargaining is controlled by the president of SCIU, that he has the right to appoint bargaining committees, determine the agenda for that bargaining without membership democracy, without participation, right? Uh, our 100 person rank and file executive board unanimously uh, rejected that. 
We had meetings of 5,000 shop stewards throughout the state of California, and they almost unanimously rejected that, knowing full well that SEIU would have the legal authority to take over their union and fire their officers and remove their stewards. Uh, and that's what they did in January of 2009, uh, immediately removed 3,000 stewards, fired staff, fired the executive board. And uh, when that happened, uh, NUHW was born. Uh, as Ellen mentioned, this board decided to turn the page, reforming SEIU was not possible, and we formed uh, the National Union of Healthcare Workers. Within a three-month period, with no paid staff, 100,000 workers in California, working for almost 100 different employers, petitioned the NLRB to leave SEIU and join NUHW. Uh, you know, at that time, uh, we were naive. We had no imagination um, how the inappropriate influence SEIU would have, both on the NLRB and the Obama administration. Uh, and these workers, uh, some of them for years, some to this day, uh, were denied an opportunity to vote, right, to, to exercise that democratic right. Um, since then, right, we've, we've uh, organized 10,000 workers into our union. We're now a union of 10,000 workers, uh, almost 30 separate employers, uh, but many more thousands are, are still waiting to have that opportunity to vote. You know, how we're fighting uh, the industry in these times of quote-unquote austerity is, is not complicated. Um, first of all, you know, we speak the truth to workers about corporate profits and, and articulate a vision with workers on, on how they can win. Um, again, in partnership with SEIU and some other national unions, uh, these companies are aggressively lowering workers' expectations. You know, the, the line that's most often said is, in these tough economic times, you should be lucky to even have a job, right? Um, in, in fact, you know, there's a, I'm going to talk more about Kaiser because it's the largest company in the, in the country, healthcare company in the country. And uh, organized labor has a labor management partnership with Kaiser. That's a terrible, terrible thing. Um, it includes almost 100,000 workers in 30 different unions. And it's led by SEIU, who represents over half of the 100,000. And the, the leader of SEIU in, in California, uh, his name is Dave Reagan. At a recent convention, he was preparing folks for bargaining with Kaiser, and this is his quote. Only 10% of U.S. workers have defined benefit pensions. We can't expect to have pensions when 90% of American workers don't have them, right? Well, the fact is 90% of hospital workers in this country don't have a union. Only 10% do, and that's why they have a defined benefit pension. And by that same logic, you know, why would they have a grievance procedure if 90% of workers in this country don't have a grievance procedure? You know, in the first few weeks uh, after Reagan and SEIU did this hostile takeover, they bargained a contract with this little hospital in Alameda, California. And this uh, employer achieved the end of employer paid health care, which has been a standard in our hospital since the 60s in California. And that employer was quoted in the newspaper saying, this is groundbreaking, right, this, this achievement. And, uh, that was the beginning of uh, SEIU bargaining every single contract in California over the next three years, and every one of those contracts included takeaways in health care, elimination of defined benefit pensions, wage freezes, reduction in other benefits, elimination of health care worker voice, and establishing uh, staffing levels, etc. Um, so, uh, I'm proud to say that since then, over those same three years, we bargained contracts with about 25 employers and without a single takeaway, right? Maintaining the standards and taking steps forward, right? In the same state, in the same towns that the CAU is doing this. Um, and I want to give you a couple examples. There's a hospital uh, in Salinas, California, where we had a 30-year relationship with this hospital, the highest, among the highest wages in the state. All the standards that I described earlier. Never a strike. We co coordinated help for this hospital to expand at times and just had a very respectable relationship based on power, appropriate balance of power. 
Well, in this environment where all of their competitors are, are achieving all these takeaways, Salinas decided to take us on. And it took us uh, about a year and a half, but put together a, you know, a corporate campaign um, that went after the leaders of this hospital, organized the workers to a one-day strike that was almost unanimous, you know, 900 workers. And under the threat of a second one-day strike, uh, they settled a contract with us that included no takeaways whatsoever uh, and very significant wage increases, took steps forward. Um, a week after we settled that contract, there are 30 uh, pharmacists at this hospital that have never been in a union. Uh, they, they voted to join us, you know, and uh, in their bargaining, we achieved getting them back the defined benefit pension that the hospital eliminated a couple of years earlier. A uh, similar story with USC in Southern California. Big, huge university hospital, mobilizes students in the community. Again, we had uh, a strike there in, in coordination with the California Nurses Association, and under the threat of a second strike, they said it. Um, we are in a three-year war with Kaiser. This is the only employer that we haven't won a contract with yet, um, because SEIU has agreed to takeaways with this employer that Kaiser now expects to achieve from the 4,500 uh, professional workers that we represent. Um, and these workers aren't, aren't accepting it. Um, we've done incredible work. Uh, these are mental health uh, clinicians. Incredible work um, doing a systemic, system-wide analysis of how Kaiser understaffing in the mental health field uh, is rampant, uh, just to increase their profits. And filed, you know, like uh, with the appropriate state regulators, got the state of California to now join us, and. They're increasing staffing all over the state while we continue to fight for a contract. These workers, uh, uh, Kaiser doesn't do dues deduction, obviously. Almost 50% of them are voluntarily paying $95 a month in dues for over three years now to support their union's fight with Kaiser uh, to win a, a fair contract. Uh, acting in solidarity with us in this Kaiser fight is the California Nurses Association and Unite Here. Uh, CNA represents 18,000 RNs in Kaiser. They are not part of this labor management partnership. Uh, and uh, we are now uh, increasing a joint campaign to achieve a contract without takeaways. And Unite Here represents the workers in Hawaii. And they're going through the same struggle, same takeaways, same strikes. Uh, so that coordination is going to increase. I want to give one other example of a contract fight that we just so clearly uh, demonstrate uh, that unions, you know, can, can fight and maintain their benefits. This is a fight with the Sutter Corporation, which is kind of the opposite of Salinas. Our history with them is strikes almost every contract cycle. And in the city of San Francisco, they have two hospitals. One is represented by SEIU, and one is represented by us, NUHW. They're four miles apart in the same city. Uh, SEIU agreed to a contract uh, with huge takeaways in um, health care and, and other benefits, pension and other benefits. Um, a month after they settled that, with a Me Too agreement with Sutter Health, that if NUHW or the CNA achieves anything better, they'll automatically get it. You with me? This is a new, a new standard in all other contracts. So that the employer is even more incentivized, right, to, to not give in to us, right, to fight us, uh, because they have to give in to the SEIU members. Well, a month after they settled that takeaway contract, without a strike, because this boss knows that 2005 we had a 60-day strike with them, uh, we settled the contract with none of the takeaways uh, and significant wage increases. Same city, same time, right, same employer. Um, so what happens next? Um, the, you know, in January 1 of this year, we entered into a formal affiliation with the California Nurses Association, uh, who had a national uh, detente agreement with SEIU to do joint organizing together and to uh, not support us. Uh, when that agreement expired at the end of December, uh, they decided, their leadership, that they had no choice but to not only not uh, renew it with SEIU, but to affiliate with NUHW because they are, in California, faced with the same struggles that we're faced with. SEIU is deteriorating all these standards uh, in the hospitals throughout the state where they represent the RNs and 
we or SEIU represents any, everyone else. Uh, in fact, the center example I just gave a minute ago, uh, SEIU or CNA has been without a contract in a dozen Sutter hospitals for three years now because the employer is proposing to gut the contract <clears throat> like SEIU has agreed to uh, in those hospitals. So our, our affiliation with the CNA continues and um, we're again working on this Kaiser contract campaign uh, to achieve uh, a contract that maintains all the standards. We're working on new organizing together. There's a large system in California, one large system left that's unorganized that we were organizing before this takeover, but we're getting back to it together. Uh, there are about 20,000 unorganized healthcare workers in that system throughout the state. Uh, CNA won an election a couple of months ago and we're now going behind them with their help organizing service and tech workers. And, um, and finally, uh, we are going to continue to help not only SEIU members, you know, escape SEIU, be liberated from SEIU, but unorganized workers uh, that are coming to us in, in very large numbers because of all the, the success that we've had. Um, you know, I wanted to mention two systems that have not yet gotten to vote. You know, these 90,000 workers that petitioned the NLRB but still haven't had an opportunity to vote. One is uh, a corporation called Dignity, 30 uh, Catholic hospitals throughout the state. In the middle of the contract, despite their huge profits, SCIU just gave away the defined benefit pension without a vote. Just agreed with the employer uh, to give it up. Again, it's a transactional deal in exchange for growth, right, as the hospital, as the hospital expands. Saved the hospital over $220 million in the first year. They agreed to a wage freeze despite $1.8 billion in profits. Uh, there's a leader in this chain called Starler who uh, did her best to organize against this kind of uh, Worked for this uh, employer for 35 years. Dignity laid her off. SEIU refused to file a grievance. There are many examples of rank and file leaders, SEIU members that are standing up to them or they're co cooperating with the employer to get them fired or laid off. Um, one other example, Daughters of Charity Health System, 5,000 SEIU members, settled a contract on a Saturday night at 10 p.m., eliminating the pension, 25% monthly increase on health insurance, a uh, implemented a, uh, an evasive wellness program that penalizes workers for not being well. Uh, well, SEIU's constitution says they have to give workers three days notice and paper of ratification meetings. They sent an email at 10 p.m. Saturday night <laughs> saying that the contract will be voted on 10 a.m. Sunday morning. <laughs> this, is, this is a real story, this happened. Uh, obviously, very few people voted. They declared it ratified, right? And, and it's done. Uh, you know, we're helping these workers file a lawsuit. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the workers contacted, contacted the president of SEIU and their local union by email, after this email went out, protesting. <coughs> filed internal charges with the, uh, Mary Kay Henry, president of SEIU in DC. Totally ignored. So we're helping these workers pursue other avenues to achieve justice. You know, I wanted to mention, um, we're being criticized by some in the labor academic world and by some unions uh, for wasting resources on raiding other unions. Some are saying that we should only be organizing unorganized workers. That's a waste of money and resources and time. Uh, with so many unorganized workers in this country. Um, well, we disagree with that. And, and it's, uh, why shouldn't workers be able to choose which union they want to represent them or to make their union accountable to a program, right, that, that they pay for? I, I say a similar analogy is, you know, I have a, I have a congressman that rep rep represents me. Why should we spend millions of dollars electing somebody different when I'm already represented? with me. Um, you know, I conclude with this uh, story that happened to me a couple of months ago. Um, this uh, rank and file leader named Maria, 
uh, walked into our office, who I haven't seen since the 80s. We've been through lots of struggles together. Uh, just haven't seen her in a, in a very long time. And she had a contract uh, with high standards, as, I, as I've talked about. Uh, she said she came in for help because SEIU walked into her building the day before and announced that uh, their facility was sold. And they bargained with the new employer and managed to get a new contract with this employer. Unfortunately, it included a $3 per hour deduction for starting workers' pay. Uh, and eight, uh, up to $800 a month for health insurance for one's family. Uh, reducing vacation, holidays, and sick leave by a third. Uh, and she was told, this is the best we could do. It's your job now to ratify it. So the story of Maria is not unusual. It's what people are experiencing every day in California, and uh, we'll continue to do all we can to, to help them uh, change their lives. Thanks. Thank you. Back to the drawing board, went back to our hospital, started targeting leaders, 
mapping our workplace, uh, making lists, and um, really trying to do a kind of scientific analysis of where we were. We hadn't done that. That was kind of when we recognized our first mistake. When I say we, the we changed over time, I've been consistent, but we've had new leaders come and go. Because people really do get burned out over time, and they get very discouraged with the labor movement and with their unions, especially when the unions are corrupt and ineffective. Excuse me a minute, Judy. Can folks in the back hear Judy okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. sorry. Okay. So in the meantime, <laughs> Back in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of progressive collectives in the New York City area. We had one called Nurses Network. I got involved because I was an artist, so you know they recruited me to do the artwork. And you know, kind of got a good education. Some people who were in the left and you know very developed, and you know, tried we tried to help one another. But you know, people got burned out and became nurse practitioners and policy people, and went to Cuba and all this stuff. And very few of us. I was the only one in that group remaining as a staff nurse. Um, still working in the ER. So um, to develop our work, what we had to do is identify what was the culture of the workplace. You know, we had, um, you know, what's the age, young, old, male, female, mostly female profession. What was our uh, racial background, ethnicity? Where we we have militant units and we have passive units. Were people pro union or did they see the union as a way to get a Blue Cross card? Um, did people believe in social justice? Did they have a consciousness? And how do they communicate? Nowadays, people communicate very differently than we did uh, 30 years ago. And do they think about union democracy? And what does that mean to people? We found out that most people didn't even understand what a union was. In my organization, we couldn't even say the U word until about eight years ago. We weren't, couldn't call ourselves a union. That's how backward it was. So our focus met, and again, over time, what we did is we made a reputation for ourselves. Um, a lot of us in the group, uh, you know, won local victories. Uh, even the small stuff really matters because that's very important. A lot of times people think you go out for the glory and the big strikes. No, you have to really fight those little battles too. And we had to be honest and recognize when we when we didn't when we made mistakes. And we were honest with our members. And we got their trust and we were able at some point to mobilize and really win big wins in the eighties and nineties for nurses in terms of salaries and benefits. Um, we got good contracts. We had militant figures especially in my facility. Some of the facilities were much more militant than the others at the Pigeon Monitor Hospital where I work. And so what did NYSA do? And what do most organizations do that have grown up? First they think you're invisible, and then they try to marginalize you, and then they try to co-opt you. And that was our, our second mistake. We got, some of us got co-opted into the incredible bureaucracy of the organization, and I think there are some people who are uh, taking over their unions. We had not taken over, we were not in power, but we had positions. Um, yes very locked into the bureaucracy of the union, big danger. In our union, which was totally, the structure was ridiculous. Uh, I, I won't go into that, it's another slideshow in itself, but our structure was absolutely impossible to understand and to work with. And we just tried to figure it out, and we ended up chasing our tails. <laughs> um, meanwhile, the old guard, the people um, who were in control, saw us as a threat, started uh, fomenting a lot of nasty things behind our backs. And while we were grinning happily in, into the bureaucracy sunset, they were taking care of business. Uh, our caucus stopped meeting, big mistake number three. We got so involved with the bureaucracy and we started losing touch with our base because we got so involved in trying to build the union on a state and national level. And meanwhile, the, I think every union has their evil three or four or five, we had an evil three. One is always the mastermind kind of evil person behind, then there's the, the axe, the hatchet woman or hatchet man, and then there's the public persona. We had that. And um, we, <laughs> we, we thought we were doing something. We became a group of resolutionaries. I learned that from some people, I think from teachers. Um, and we, you know, we passed a lot of great resolutions, but the union had no ability to, to implement any of that. And meanwhile, the evil empire was after us. Uh, we got locked into trying to build a national union. Um, but that national union got went to war. The staff of the national union, the staff of NYSA was at war, and the nurses were torn in that struggle, and we didn't really know what to do. And then they attacked. You know, we were publicly scandalized in all the public meetings. All, these, all of us who had a lot of trust of our members were absolutely just demonized by the leadership who had all control of the media, and people stopped trusting us, were afraid to be seen with us. 
we were just castigated, shouted down, it was disgusting tactics. Um, and the members got really turned off, and not so much against us, but just turned off in general. But certainly a lot of people were accessed, you know, they, they, they stuffed ballots, they did committed sabotage, it was horrible. And they basically, you know, put our heads on the lampposts to make sure that nobody would ever follow us. Um, they even stole my email address. They figured out how to spoof, spoof me and sent emails from me and did things like this to people. Um, so we, we, we got disciplined. We were trying to, they tried to remove us and we went to court and we had to raise money. So our enemies taught us a lot at this point, you know, because we didn't know how to raise money before and we had to do all kinds of fundraising. Um, and after a while, we, we won. We, we, um, we won our case. We, then we said we really have to build this caucus. We had a website, symbols, and we exposed <laughs> the villains. Um, tried to link a strong union with union democracy. So this gave us a forum because people saw how we were treated so harshly and that they didn't have a voice. And when we won our case in court, um, we thought we had something. But meanwhile, they had still fomented so much distrust, it was really hard to build anything. So we went back to work. And we formed a new caucus with a new name since the old name has been so demonized. We were, okay, formed something new, had a nice little symbol, um, with pictures. You know, we had learned now how to do stuff. Um, glossy stuff we put out, um, with, with really largely through our connections through labor notes and meeting people from the CNA, from NNU, from Massachusetts nurses, from other progressive unions, from uh, people in UE, Teachers Democratic Union, um, brothers and sisters and uh, transit workers. Um, the take back our union. We, we learned a lot about how to do things. Um, and, you know, we did grassroots organizing. And we won. We won our first majority of the board a couple of years back. We, it worked. And, uh, but the leadership wouldn't seat us. We won six seats and they refused to seat us. Um, they again launched attacks against us. This time, amazingly, I said we were tools of SCIU and California Nurses <laughs> Association at the same time. <laughs> which was pretty incredible. Uh, we were anarchists, we were communists, we were, we were everything that they could think of. Uh, we had to go uh, to court to get seated. And uh, the judge was, who was a right-wing judge, was so disgusted with the leadership for not seating us. I mean, um, he called them Alice and one, you know, they were like Alice and one. Um, so we, so uh, we won in court and still able to seat us. And um, they, the court filed an injunction against NYSA, and still they wouldn't see us. <laughs> uh, so we had a plan B. <laughs> uh, we raided the office, and on uh, October 2011, we took control. We just took over the office and kicked them all out. We, we, got uh, we still had our structure, our ridiculously confused structure, which, you know, at some point, I always used to say it was better being a dissident than being in control. And that uh, inheriting niceness is sort of like adopting kids from a crack house. Um, meanwhile, our enemies were at work. We, um, we had 28,000 members with open contracts at the time that we inherited a mess from the organization. The American Nurses Association, which was a national, sort of very reactionary professional association, uh, was pulling strings with the American Hospital Association, the um, group of employers, uh, with the nurse executives. Um, and with our evil people and the hospitals to try to screw us. Um, so what we did is, we had done this before because we had the caucus, so the caucus was really visible at this point. We had formed an alliance with the different hospitals and we decided to take strike votes all at the same time and go out on strike together. Um, <coughs> during our Christmas time, when we knew that we get a lot of sympathy and also a lot of nurses never got Christmas and New Year's off, so that really got us a lot of votes. Um, and we were front page of New York Times, we got all this publicity. Uh, meanwhile, the, the evil people uh, tried to uh, unite against us. They trashed the strike, they put wanted posters of us, they, uh, a &A suspended us, and all the nurses put together, well, gee, the old leadership, the a, a this national organization, the hospital association, and the bosses are all in cahoots, which we didn't have to say it, they figured that out. And then in one week, we won contract for 10,000 nurses, and because of the strike threat, and none of us had to go out on strike, we got, most of us got pretty few contracts with very little give back to them. Um, then we had the hard work of constructing the union, so we had to change our structure. We mobilized the largest group ever, uh, which this is, you, 
look at this, I couldn't believe this is nice about five years ago. You know, it could have mobilized three people to something. Um, and we had staff, and we decided to identify what's our key campaign, safe staff. That was something that captured the hearts and minds of all the nurses. Um, we still had four seats to take over the board. When we changed our structure, we had actually 15 seats to take over. And uh, we swept every single seat, all 21 seats. Um, by the biggest voter turnout in history, it was more than one margin. So we kind of felt we had a mandate mm -hmm. uh, and a total sweep. And then our, we had the largest annual meeting since ANA had already told everyone whose side they were on. We left ANA, saved ourselves some money. And then the very next day, Hurricane Sandy hit. And as a new organization, we said, you know, we have to respond to this crisis. And we did. We mobilized. We uh, made contact with Occupy Sandy, started to build our community labor alliance, um, and nurses volunteered in these hard hit areas and were able to really have an impact. And then we were also uh, instrumental in helping to expose the city of New York and Mayor Bloomberg uh, for not responding to the, hur uh, to the hurricane and to its victims. We had multiple demonstrations with many allies. Um, also started to make the links between public health and universal health system and, you know, where's the disaster plan? There, there was no disaster plan. So it left us with a lot of challenges, but also opportunities. And the things we learned um, was, you know, how did we do it? A lot of it is luck, guys. You know, you have to be ready to move when that happens, be prepared. We made a lot of mistakes. We took risks. Um, we were lucky, I guess. Call it luck. We had a very incompetent, corrupt leadership. <laughs> I guess that's lucky when you're trying to take over your union. Um, there was also internal conflict, and we had the economic situation. Our pension benefits were under attack. The bosses were attacking us. Disciplines in the workplace escalated. So we continued doing that work. We reached out. We tried to be nice to each other, um, and we tried to build on on certain principles. You know, being accountable, having a democratic structure, being taking risks. Communication, which is, I think, always a problem when you're doing so much, it's hard to communicate it. Building community and having some humility that we had a lot to learn and, um, you know, trying to rest. But we couldn't rest because what happened? As soon as we, but we had a break, we started facing these incredible attacks against Brooklyn hospitals and other hospitals. And um, so what we did is we hired a, a, an incredibly human being that happened to be sitting here. Her name is Jill Ferrillo. She's from the <coughs> nurses in NNU, and we hired her as our executive director. Jill brought us a lot of skills and uh, helped us round out what our plan was. So she did the ground running, and we organized the movement to save Long Island College Hospital, which was uh, scheduled to close. Nobody thought we could possibly do anything about it. We had nurses speaking about it. Some nurses who had never spoken publicly became leaders. We even got 1199 SEIU to join us in fighting the boss. This was, this may give us hope in how local rank and file or local structures can actually turn their own unions around. Um, you know, 1199 is a very big local in, uh, in SEIU. We'll see what happens with that. Um, we galvanized our community. Um, and then we had a new paradigm. Instead of save Lich, we said Lich open for care. You know, we weren't, we were, we're not saving, we, it's, our, it's open. We weren't going to close it. Because, you know, when they want to close a hospital, they have to get rid of the patients. And when the administration said, um, move the patients out, the nurses said, no, we're not going to do that. We got EMS, emergency medical teams, and the transporters and the other workers to all cooperate. We recruited patients to come to the hospital and 99% capacity. And our line was not save Lich, but Lich is open. There's, there's no problem here. The nurses were basically running the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, even they had a stroller brigade, <laughs> which got us a lot of publicity with the little kids. Um, I couldn't find the pictures. You're with a little pacifier in his mouth, and it says, don't pacify me. <laughs> I couldn't find that. Um, and well, that went back down. And um, you know, we won that battle. We continued doing militant actions at the time, because the nurses were really energized. We fought City Hall. We won. Um, we had actually a march in the Capitol, and people joined us. You know how when you end your march, you give your speeches, there was a, a patient, a, a visitor there who joined our march and got up on the thing to speak to, <laughs> uh, talking about nurses. We found that they were very loved and respected. Um, we started launching, you know, continued to launch our safe staffing fight. We had a huge mobilization, uh, 1,500, 2,000 people in Albany about a week ago. Um, with all the nurses from all over joining with four other, three other unions, 
including 1199, um, CAF and uh, CWA fighting for safe staffing and for safe patient handling, and really started moving the bills through the houses. But at the same time, what do we have to do? We have to develop our leaders. So we have an intense steward training program. We're trying to train 500 people within a year. And um, we've started doing that already, about 100 already. Um, you know, and we, we continue our fights. You know, we're fighting against some of the, the community things that are really harm our communities, so typically the need, which creates accountability for these hospitals. Um, joining with other coalitions um, and, you know, just continuing those fights because we have contract battles ongoing. Um, and what, is, what does that mean? That means that, you know, we're in the process. We are a work in progress trying to build a militant union uh, through our small victories, our big victories, educating our members, uh, and, and really trying to let people know what we're doing, launching a plan of education for our, um, our people.
But keep your strong unit strong. I'm running out of space. Keep your strong unit strong. Shoulder. Keep your strong unit strong even while you do this. A lot of work. Um, and develop new leaders. Because without new leaders, particularly young people, many of them, many new leaders, can just have one. And don't be surprised if they overrule you. <laughs> if you have a democratic structure, that can happen. Um, and you know, educate your members. It takes a long time. Um, and most important. Be honest with yourself and be honest with your members because they'll always figure you out and understand when you're weak, when you're strong, and what you have to do. Because the worst thing is, is to make sure that people tell you the things you want to hear instead of the things you don't want to hear. And we are facing big challenges ahead of us and the only way we're going to win is by doing all these things and developing new leaders to help us to do them. Yeah, Judy, you said that you're having problems keeping your caucus going. Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Why do you think that is, and what are you going to do about it? Well, the core group of the caucus all won office, so we're now <clears throat> kind of running the organization. But, uh, you know, we had a base there, but we're so overwhelmed with the, with the work of the organization. And our structure right now, unlike other unions, our elected leaders still have to work full-time jobs. So until we change that that structure, it's it, you know, and 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 the one those of us. So let me explain like what typical board member is. A nice enough. You're working full time. You're probably president of your local hospital, which could be thousands of nurses like I have, and you're on the board, and you don't get release time for things. So it's really hard to also have a caucus come to the new left farm raise your family, deal with your sick parents. I mean, it's really, really a challenge. So we have to, I, one thing I didn't mention here is release time. We've got to, I think other unions have it a little better. And I'm not sure that that model's great. Like, I think the ideal model is to have people working a certain period of time in the workplace, like maybe a couple of shifts in our case a, a month, and also then do the rest of union time. Because I've seen too many people forget what that's like, and things change dramatically. And when you start losing touch, 
I think that's a problem. So I think the model that I'd like to see us try to create is where we work a little bit uh, throughout the year and do most of our work, um, you know, running the organization. Um, because the way we have it now, we're very dependent on staff. Even though, and, and we still are, are overwhelmed. So we have to come up with a better structure and it's a process of changing our structure. But we, you know, we're keeping in mind we have to keep the caucus on. <laughs> uh, it's just we don't have the capacity to, to really keep it built right now. And it wasn't a huge caucus. It became, it, you know, as I said, people came and left. So it became almost an electoral caucus, which is not our intent. Our intent was an issues caucus. And I think that's a big danger for us. Uh, I, you know, we're, and many of us are aware of it. It's just we just don't have the capacity at this point, and we have to really work on it. Uh, much of what you said rang a lot of bells with me. Uh, I spent about 15, 20 years of my life working in a movement to uh, reform and revitalize the newspaper guild in New York in, from the late 70s to the mid 90s. And we had two different caucuses at different times and went through a lot of this stuff. I mean, I'm certainly, I know uh, what happens with. Um, when you talked about the members getting turned off, you know, we had this situation where um, there were two, you know, it's like trench warfare between two sides, and uh, it often seemed, I think, to members that we were more interested in fighting each other than we were fighting the boss, and that really hurt us. Um, and many other things happened, which are quite similar to what the question I have. One of the things that's hampered us the most, in a way, was, um, that the conservatives who ran the, the local were able to drive wedges between different segments of the workforce because we were an industrial union. Uh, we represented uh, reporters and copy editors, but also advertising, advertising sales people, classified uh, people, circulation, et cetera, et cetera. And they were able to, to uh, use a sort of false anti elitism to. to you know, because we would tend to be based upon the news department side. And uh, as I understand it, uh, NiceNet is like uh, a craft based, right? It's, it's um, all nurses. And I wonder if that actually it helped, helped protect you from the kind of divisions and uh, you know, divisiveness. Um, yeah, I think Sal probably you know, deals with those that, you know, NUHW has is broader, even though it's in one industry, I think, you know, they, I'm sure that they deal with a lot of those issues in terms of bringing people together. We, you know, they'll always find something to rip you apart. I mean, we have demographics of race and location. There was big, you know, they tried to divide us by geography, by big hospital, little hospital, by young nurses, by older nurses, by different races. Um, <laughs> there's always differences. And your enemies are going to always try to, you know, do something about those differences. The thing is to develop campaigns where people really can understand the the, two, the different sides, the different needs of the different groups, and how, you know, being to, and nobody can win alone. I mean, I think the big thing: nobody can win alone, and let's understand each other, and you know, let's have a common, very broad, uh, broad platform, very broad focus that everyone can unite around, and then the little stuff gets dealt with on on different levels. Because um, I think most people will understand that nobody can win alone, not in this time period. You could have said that maybe 20 years ago, but not now. Yeah, the, the hospital industry, it, it, there's a hierarchy where you know, doctors think that they're gods, right? right. And they run the hospital, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, and there are many conflicts, like 200 plus classifications of workers in hospitals. And there are times conflicts you know, over scope of practice and and nurse issues versus dietitian issues. But our experience is there's no better place to work out those conflicts than inside one house, right? Um, or partnerships to act like one union, which hopefully you'll achieve someday you know, with other unions, and that's what we're hoping to achieve. Um, so that, that's our experience. And again, people can't win alone. You know, we've, we've had experiences where respiratory therapists think that they should have a separate union because they're professionals compared to housekeepers, right, or dietary workers. I remind folks when it comes to lobbying in Sacramento or 
or strikes, right? It's those dietary workers and housekeepers that are the first on the bus to knock on doors, right, and do politics to, to support their profession. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions because one, you The biggest weakness was our biggest strength of the structure. The structure was not really centralized. They had no strategy. Remember, they weren't a union. So they developed these professional autonomous structures that kind of had a lot of freedom. Um, they would step in and try to harm us and squash us, and they certainly sent in organizers to my place to disrupt everything that I did. I was the president, but they had secret meetings without me, you know, stuff like that. But, um, you know, that gave us a lot of freedom to organize on, on that local level. Our structure, I don't know if you can replicate that in other areas, our structure lends itself to you know, talented, experienced people being able to do a whole lot. Um, but I think the standard rule is that most people are very unhappy. And you know, we had to switch gears all the time to, to flip into what motivated people. You know, we were a workforce that was getting really harmed in a very personal, emotional way. So tapping into that emotion was very effective in, in the different places around the different issues. And at one, at, in the later times we were able to take over, we had most of the big hospitals organized around whatever their issue was, and very angry at the leadership. If it wasn't for the leadership, we wouldn't have been able to do it. The leadership was so obviously incompetent and corrupt, um, even though people were buying into it. It had a really good PR, but I think that the structural, that's what led us to do that, but they certainly tried to disrupt us, and they defeated one of our key leaders. They defeated her in a local election by, you know, going around with the ballot boxes and doing stuff like that. Um, when they tried to do it at my workplace, we just organized the hell out of it and, you know, beat them like nine to one in a local election uh, because they were so stupid. They had the person they chose to run against me run against me as president, and she was currently in our executive committee as the grievance chair. So she ran for two offices, and people thought that was so horrible. And they liked her, so that you know they, everything they did helped us. <laughs> you know, I would add that um, you know we've learned <clears throat> this last four years that <clears throat> there really needs to be labor law reform that protects union workers from union bosses. You know, they really union leaders have the upper legal hand, and most union leaders in this country, you know, are like Judy's predecessors, or like the people running SCIU today. You know, they're not selfless people at all. They're more concerned about making sure the lights don't go off, you know, on their watch so that their pension's safe, etc. Um, when we wrote our constitution, when our members wrote our constitution, we, we tried to learn from those examples. So in that constitution are things like stewards or bargaining committee members have to be elected and they have to be re-elected every three years and they can only be recalled by the same constituency. And you only need 50 signatures of workers to run for president of our union. And by constitution, the union president can't make more money than the highest paid worker that we represent. You know, a whole bunch of things like that, right, to prevent 
the kind of corruption and selfishness, right, that is the norm in the late movement today. Yeah, I guess this is a question for the panel, but also maybe for the She's the Jill from the movie, by the way. Of the declining rate of profit that we experience, and with that set in motion, 
was this wave of insurgent, wildcat, democratic, internal union reform movements that were very militant, fighting both their union bosses and, and fighting the actual bosses. So these result at certain times in history because of political and economic forces. It's quite clear. I think we see this within labor notes easily because we see this tendency beginning. And it is especially important, the field I came from was not healthcare, but education is quite obvious in education. And the victory of the core caucus, take over the leadership of the Chicago Teachers Union, <coughs> lead to one of the most successful, argument, unquestionably successful public sector strikes, or any strike in recent memory. This is an anti-austerity strike. It's an anti-neoliberalism strike. And it has sparked tremendous interest. And there are caucuses just like flaring up all over the country. <coughs> So I think, in part, the answer to the question, and we'll let Judy and Sal also contribute to this, is uh, the opportunities are there now, and they are only going to increase because the crisis of capitalism does not take care of itself. It only is taken care of by the squeezing of workers and the squeezing of consumers. And the only question that remains is, will the union structure, either at the workplace level or the intermediate or at the national level, Will the leadership either help the education and mobilization of workers at the base? Will they just stand aside and not interfere if workers are doing that? Or will they actively repress it? In the case of SEIU, they actively repress it. In some other cases, it is a little bit more passive. But any of us on the left side of the labor movement cannot miss this moment. We cannot. We have to be inside the unions making reforms. Do you guys want to add to that before our next question? Well, you know, it's about empowering workers, right? Um, and it's staff intensive uh, and very hard. It takes a long time initially, but that investment eventually uh, allows a union to spend much more money on external organizing because you build that foundation. And, and it's first for training and education. You have to give folks the tools to be able to fight their employer, right? Um, to train stewards to train other students, right? That kind of deep education and training. And then structurally giving people real power so that nothing happens at a workplace that isn't directed in by the, the people that work there as opposed to a staff person. So that politically, you know, uh, uh, the constituency about, uh, that a politician has, they make the decisions about who to endorse and how to spend the union's money on politics. It's that. Because if people are empowered, then they're excited. They're going to want to put more time into their union. And it, it also will, it has the effect of showing unorganized workers, right, the value of being in a union and, and then wanting to be a part of it. Um, you know, yeah, you use this example over this 1,000-member uh, hospital in Fresno, California, where we had 60, 70 stewards and chief stewards, right, that were so well-trained, right, and uh, you'd, I'd walk through this hospital, and everyone didn't know me. And one thing that's so obvious is people loved their employer there, because it was a great place to work. Um, people had great wages and benefits, and there were no open grievances, because all the problems were resolved between the stewards and the management. And we did not have to have an assigned staff person to that hospital. Because the workers, the leaders didn't want one, because who's the boss want to talk to if you have an assigned staff person, right? Um, that's like the, an extreme example of what we strive for, to, for everywhere. And I, I can't imagine ever being really happy in a workplace, but I guess uh, that would be nice. Um, I, I, think, um, I think, you know, it's sort of you have to really keep your eyes open, your ears open, and you have to have multiple structures of the union doing that work. Like Jill sending out, you know, calls for mobilization every day, so our members have no shortage of mobilization issues that they can that we could organize around. It's a lot of work for us. At the same time, in the local units, we have to pay attention when any, anything comes up. You know, you know, we used to have this thing about you know, filing grievances and the contract, and you know, now when we, we meet with the nurses, we just say, you know, we have this book, you know, yeah, you know, we can file a grievance, but you know, if you guys are united around this issue, you can't lose. You know, they're and teaching people different tactics about how to get things done um, on, on, a, on a very, very, very local level, on a hospital-wide level, and in, in the state. And we have kind of a tri-level activity going on, not equally in all places. Some places are very dead, 
Um, some places are very much alive. Some, you know, everyone has a different talent. Some people are more interested in doing work around a community kind of effort. Some people are more interested in legislation. Some people are more interested in dealing with the local local unit. But when we do steward training, and I have to thank NUHW, we've gotten so many people from NUHW. I feel so bad about it in a way. Uh, <laughs> But you know, really talented people who've been through that struggle and brought those strengths to us. I mean, Gabe is one of them, and some of our leaders who are, are uh, involved in the training. Um, you know, teaching people different tactics that people are not used to. You know, because a lot of stuff you can't train leaders to go around defending marginal workers. That's a big burnout. And you know, I'll be honest. You know, that that is really something that turns a lot of people up to the union, particularly in a in a service or in the union where people are supposed to be providing quality service to a population that you're, you're supposed to protect and then you as a union leader going around you know thinking am I like doing the right thing and saving this job this person that could kill my mother one day you know it's very challenging or people who are you know just have issues so you have to be able to organize workers and around their their issues that have to do with the things that they do the things that matter and craft that vision I've never <coughs> gone to a unit where there wasn't a place where you could build something whether they had a bullying manager or the equipment didn't work, or the staffing was bad, which is, is everywhere, or you know they weren't able to practice nursing the way they wanted, or they didn't, or didn't feel like they could have a vision, or they didn't have autonomy. There's always something in an area which you can build and try to develop leadership around around those areas. Um, but it's incredibly labor intensive, no shortcut. You know, and I think what Sal's saying is true, and what we've tried to do is developing our stewards and doing the follow up, which is also a challenge. I mean, I, I was telling one of our members, our biggest strength is our biggest weakness. We're trying to do too much, or so much, and sometimes we kind of make mistakes and leave, don't dot our I's, cross our T's, and you know, I apologize to people about it. <laughs> but it, it, there's no other way. <coughs> I don't know if I answered. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Please. Um, I just wanted to say, when you had copies for a revolutionary you were when talking about, um, you know, yeah, how to keep it going, how to keep a union going, how to keep a movement. It's really about the movement. And my first labor experience, um, I was in my 20s, and I was living in Fremont, California, and I got a job at the UA, the, the UAW plant, and there was most of the other brother of And it was extraordinary to watch something like this happen. Uh, a move, it was, you know, it was a huge movement. There were maybe 5,000 workers at the plant, but the caucus itself, you could have a meeting with three to 400 people. <coughs> and um, the idea was to take back the union and to democratize it and to really have it as a rank and file led movement, what you can do. And um, the actual, this, it probably took over a year, the whole battle, to replace the entrenched leadership. And it happened through education, really helped mobilizing people about what is the union. What does it mean to be in the union? And that you are the union. The leadership is the union. Unfortunately, what happened, we elected a, a new, we call the shop chairman, an unbelievably dynamic. I mean, he worked on the motor line. He was a dynamic speaker. He, he was, you know, we were mesmerized by him. And when he got elected, one of the first things he did was to dissolve the caucus. And eventually, a few years later, he got a job in the International. And I'll never forget that, because I've been involved in unions ever since then. And I'll never forget that lesson. And it gets back to what, you, what, what Jill was saying, that this, has, this is an ongoing struggle, you know, because you, when, when you think you have it, there are always those who are working underneath to 
basically for power or cutting deals, as you've been describing, cutting deals with management. And I know one of the things I read in the newspaper about um, SEIU in, in, I guess, in California, that you have people in leadership who are making deals and money. I mean, making huge amounts of money while they're in union leadership, cutting deals with management. So, so that's the nature to me of the labor movement, the reconcile leadership, the ongoing struggle to keep the union um, down, always down to its basis. And it's very hard because you have members, and that's your strength. It's your weakness, but also your strength that your executive board are full-time nurses. And that strength is that they are rooted in the hospital. And of course, the weakness is the amount of time but that they can spend. But you know, what you've done is, is critical. How to keep it, I think, somehow figuring out a way to keep that caucus, you know, to re Juvenate the pockets and, and have it operate to always make sure that the union is, you know, not being co-opted. Because that's the word. Unions get co-opted. Leaders get co-opted. It's, you know, it's the nature of our nation. You know, everything. Progressive movements get co-opted. Please, one, we'll go one, two, three, four. Please. I just want to understand what co-opted means. I mean, I suppose. If somebody offers you a deal and you take it because it sounds good, I, I don't really understand what you go off of. I mean, how does it work? Um, this is I think that's a really good question because, you know, having a contract is making a deal, right? You know, having a labor management meeting is making a deal. You're always making deals. I think you have to. You have to kind of remind yourself and remind your boss and remind your people, you know, what the issues are. I mean, every time we get along with management, I always make a point of saying, this doesn't obviate our obvious conflict, you know, our eternal conflict that will never go away. You know, I, I kind of, and they say, why do you always have to, you know, be, you know, the cloud in the room, you know? And I'm like, I just want to remind you that this is really great what we're doing, but it doesn't mean we're on the same side. We're not. You know, and, and that's okay, and I'm really happy we're doing, you know, and I say it because I have to remind myself of it because sometimes you think, oh my God, you know, this is amazing what they're doing. You know, they're agreeing, that, you know, because usually they'll come back and they'll kick you in the ass, you know, like it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how good it looks. So, and then you have to remind your people about it. So being co-opted doesn't mean, you know, you have an agreement. It means that you're fooled by thinking that somehow that, that paradigm changes, that you're on the same side, because you're not. I mean, I've yet to, I mean, maybe like that hot, I don't know, <laughs> that hot where everyone's happy. I, I've never worked in one of those, but <clears throat> even then, I'm sure when push comes to shove, people go to the sides that they have to go to. And I'm sure that that's the way it is because people make it very clear about what they're willing to do if they don't get what they need. So I think being co-opted is, is just being sucked in and giving up your principles and, and forgetting who you are and where you came from. And it's, I don't think you can, you know, every, every issue has to be analyzed. And we debate a lot internally. I've been outvoted in, I mean, I have a lot of leadership in my organization. Uh, and in my local unit, and I've been outvoted, and sometimes I think you know that was a mistake, and sometimes I think, thank God they outvoted me. You know, I've been suckered in, and I'm a really tough person, and I know what I've been suckered, and, and, and I work there, and their foot is on my neck, and I still been suckered. So I think that people really, it's good to have a group to keep to keep your feet in the fire, um, and I'll be the first to admit that I've made terrible mistakes. Thank God none of them. If, if I could offer just one other answer to that question from a different field. So um, some of you have followed the Chicago Teachers Union reform process. You may remember that after the core leadership took control of the whole union, their president, Karen Lewis, was called in into a classic allocation scenario with Rahm Emanuel and his hand-picked uh, members of the Chicago Board of Education. And they they wanted her to sit at the table and agree to some changes in their in their agreement, and I think it was around teacher evaluation. I'm not sure if I remember the issue correctly. She was a new president. It's a huge union. This was a big power shift. They knew that Emmanuel and the whole Democratic machine in Chicago was going to be incredibly fierce and tough for them. And sitting in these sessions, she made an agreement. 
and came back out and recorded it, and the membership did not accept it. And, and talk about a tough position to be in. A newly elected, untried leader who is being vilified all the time, not only by the caucus, you know, the incumbents who she's just beat, but also, of course, the whole entire power uh, administration of the city. And so what happened next was the most important thing, which was she actually said, all right, I gotta go back on this. I get my word on this, but you don't have my word, actually. Because it's up to my members. It, it happened again during the strike. Um, they were offered a deal the three days before the end of the strike. They brought it back, the bargaining team brought it to the members. Uh, they wanted actually a fast ratification vote, and the members said, we need another 24, 48 hours so we can go back to our buildings and we can talk to people. And they didn't like it, and they had to go back and turn it down. So what I think is critical in this question, because of course co-optation, it's not just one thing, it's not just when the boss tries to like bribe you or invite you to you know, come be an HR manager or something, it's every minute of every day. It's the question of where your values are and where you stand. So we hope for perfect leaders. We all hope that either we are or we work with perfect leaders. But the reality is it's got to be structural. So you need to keep your caucus. Mm -hmm. And the second most important thing is you cannot give up the actual practice of democracy for the appearance of democracy. Now this is really hard. Because caucuses can go very quickly become patronage machines. Mm -hmm. And open discussion and debate among members and leaders and so on can very quickly be poisoned by an atmosphere. I bet every one of us has been in this room at some time where you know that you can't say certain things. Because the opprobrium, the disapproval, the further sub subtle sanctioning against you from the leadership will be unbearable. So it is this closing down of debate and of a pluralistic internal governance environment. That's where the poison is. As long as you can keep that alive, then there are going to be people that will check you in the tendency to be co-opted. Okay, let's go. So, and I'll just add, um, establishing an environment that is very safe to be constructively critical, mm. right? Yes. I mean, we, we preach, we value constructive criticism to staff, to workers, right? And making sure that that environment's safe is very, very important. Your union should be the safest place in the world to disagree, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Mm -hmm. How many of us are in unions like that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I think we want to hear, or over here, then back up there, please. Yes, yeah. you, you Tim, is not there. Right? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, you, her first. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Oh, first. oh, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> Okay, so, right, so this is for sale, and um, I missed your talk. I'm sorry, I, you know, I got here late. Anyway, and I was really inspired by yours too. Uh, but um, I'm from the Midwest, and there is at long last some real serious hospital organization going on in the Midwest, mm -hmm. both by NNU and by uh, SEIU. And um, what, what I've seen over the last four years, maybe, is that resources are getting ripped out of the Midwest to go fight the battles in California. And if you've talked about this already, then forget it. But, um, you know, I understand, I think I understand what's at stake there, but I also understand that there's a huge cost when our organizers and our bargainers here in where I am are sent away for months at a time to fight the battles in California. And, uh, you know, I just, I just would like, you know, like you to assure me that there's some reciprocity or that, that it's worth it or, or, or what we do about that because I think it's a real problem. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason is twofold, I would say. First of all, um, there are thousands of workers in California that are trying to get out of SCIU because of who SCIU is and what they're, what they're doing to them. And these workers, um, we will continue to do everything we can to help them, right, control their own lives. Um, I would say that there can be organizing in places like the Midwest and some other states. Um, because of, these are national employers, right? Yes. That, uh, whose membership base is in California. When you talk about, see, what's different from California than New York? New York is highly unionized and a very successful, high standards. But New York doesn't have these national for-profit chains. 
Because yeah, that's what Bible yeah. yeah, that's right. So, so the base of the, the Catholics, Catholic national systems, Kaiser, Tenet, HCA, the for-profit nursing home yeah. industry, they're all in California in terms of union members where the power is. That's why SCME took us over. So letting that erode, right, um, will, will hurt people all over the country. And the opposite is true, you know, we were such a strong movement in California, uh, it would be easier to organize in other states where these corporations are not needed. Yeah, uh, just, to, just to comment on what constitutes co-optation, it, it goes back to an approach. The service model of unionism is, a, is originated as a retreat position, okay? It's where the CIO retreated from when they were going the other way. You know, they had ventured into something that, that, that the folks at the top figured got them in trouble. So that um, I'm in a member, a long time member of Local 100, and I've been an officer that Judy mentioned um, she got some help from. When we were, when we took over, the, our presidential candidate was a militant in the field, but was a firm believer in the service model of unionism. And if you have spread out rank and file activity, and it wasn't just about shutting down the caucus, it was about shutting down rank and file activity, you are a failure as a service model unionist, even a militant one. So it was not just about shutting down the caucus, it was about squashing the rank and file activity that went on uh, in the field. On the other hand, and I've been on both sides of it, uh, I probably negotiated more ex uh, agreements as a rank and filer who participated in lots of job actions, too many to count. Um, that I was as the vice president of the union. You know, basically, it was like, for a while, it was like every week I was negotiating with a local boss. And this is, this is, this is another thing. The more localized you can keep something, the better. Because those managers of whatever section that you have something going in, they're not going to tell their bosses, the top management, that they're a bad manager, because that's what it means when you've got a rebellion on your hands. So you can negotiate those agreements, and you can, and you're actually bringing the fight to the boss when there's too many fights to count in too many areas. And when you're in another period where you don't have that activity, and you have uh, several geniuses who are operating on the surface model, um, and while I've been under various release time agreements, and uh, my best, uh, what I think was best, was when I was a halftime. Um, they, however many people you have on union payroll or on release time, they can give you more things to do than you, that they can exhaust you in the grievance process where you never get out to the field. In fact, even when I was a half, I would be, I would participate, I would be leading in action in the field, and then the first thing I would do is violate the, uh, violate what my assignment was. Mm -hmm. I would go somewhere else. Uh, I would visit another location in, in the field with rank and file. And they said, well, you, were, you, you know, we had hearings scheduled. Well, you can't stop without me. I was investigating another grievance. You know, so much so, they, and there was actually um, somebody in the union actually uh, called up the inspector general. There was an inspector general's um, investigation around me. Um, fortunately, the inspector general doesn't look for the kind of violations I was committing. You know, the inspector general is looking for people who like go home and go shopping when they're on uh, release time or um, uh, some other kind of corruption. And so I would like my neighbors would um, 
uh, who told me, you know, somebody in the Inspector General's office was asking about you, and it would be, um, well, you know, he never comes home. You know, anyhow. The, uh, please, as we, this, we're getting to the last few minutes, I've, mm -hmm. oh, my watch is a little fast. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions, please. Yeah. Hi, um, I just would like to respond to the question about where do we go from here. So, I live around the room, I'm sort of a senior citizen here. I've been a nurse for over 45 years. I was an activist in the 70s um, in the American Nursing Association, and I was on the drug welfare program was was struggling uh, in conflict between the professional side and the economic side of nursing. But they were good they were good times. Um, I was involved in that struggle early on, my husband and you know, myself both. Um, one of the things that I think we don't do a good job of letting the public know, um, nursing is aging. Um, the average age of a nurse now is about 54 years old. We are are uh, we desperately need more nurses in this country. The nursing wages are very good now. I'm doing some work with uh, the University of Michigan right now. The case managers I'm working with have an average salary of $92,000. We have an excellent benefit package. So it's a wonderful, wonderful career. We should be encouraging people to um, to move into it. Um, nurses are the most trusted professionals mm -hmm. by in the, in the country in terms of healthcare professionals. And I think where we're not doing a good job is making a difference in terms of where healthcare is going. And I, we look at all these regulations that are about to unfold in the Affordable Care Act. Um, I'm living now in a hotel, and I just learned that the, work, the employees who work there have been, um, their hours have been reduced, so the company doesn't have to pay for health insurance for them. Now, I know as a nurse that if I knew that that was going on rapidly, I would want to organize around something like that. So I think there are some wonderful opportunities coming if we really, if we listen to them and if we, if we, uh, if we act on them. Uh, actually, John, the gentleman people who haven't spoken yet, okay? Please, and then we also have someone to bring something back up here. We'll go down three in the next few floors, please. Um, I came late. I thought this was starting at three o'clock. Um, this is about, uh, are there any post workers? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. um, from what I hear, there's been a lot of discussion about within the poster unions or all the unions of what the problem is. You know, the post office is trying to privatize it. So even if we had a good union and, and good structure, uh, the problem is much larger than what's in the union itself. Uh, so our, our challenge is how can we get the community uh, to support the postal struggle to keep existing. The post office, of course, provide services to the communities, especially the forest communities, the most isolated communities, the uh, communities of color, uh, the older we get, the, uh, people who don't use the internet use mail. So there's a lot of services to the community that is important for the post office to keep existing. And of course, they provide living wage jobs that help communities in many ways. The uh, problem is how you get the communities to come out and support the post office. How you get the post office, the postal workers, to support community issues. It's a, it's a, how you get our national unions, our leadership. We have four different unions in the post office. How do we get them to not only work together, but to come out with a outlook that will get the community Postal workers together, forcing Congress, forcing the postal management to uh, to fight back against these people, corporations who want to privatize. Paul, so, may I suggest that you, uh, before you leave, talk to the sample and sit next to the yeah. labor notes because there is a postal workers uh, reform you know, um, sort of network that labor notes has helped to set up. So, did you want to so we respond to the, the two, the sort of combination of the two? I think. It's very important to do a demographic analysis of your, your, your situation, right? I'm sure you've done it. I mean, and, you know, we are now, you know, so on the one hand, you know, we have strength. 
you know, we're essential workers, we can't be exported, we a growing industry, um, we're skilled, you know, we have a strike, they're dead, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, on the other hand, we're well paid in the metropolitan areas, not so much upstate and in the, in the rural areas, or the uh, non-unionized areas. Um, to the point that some people can make, you know, over $100,000 a year and maybe that they lose that identity with the working class when they're, you know, able to make that much money, especially with double earners. Um, many of our nurses are, you know, Republicans, reactionary, you know, married to cops and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, don't necessarily sympathize, forget where they came from. Most of us come from working class backgrounds, but, you know, forget that. So, but we're really well trusted, and so we have to look at that when we try to engage in these bigger struggles. And I think, you know, we're trying to model something that I think other unions can look at in terms of the Community Labor Alliance. You know, uh, we provide a service that obviously the community is invested in, right? Um, but when we had a fight for our pension and benefits in a very poor community up in the Bronx, of course, urban community in the country, um, how do we, you know, get people to support us when we're fighting for something that they don't even have? People don't have pensions, people don't have benefits. People don't have the things we were fighting for. Um, and the old union was like, well, you're nurses, you deserve it. I said, like, that's just not going to fly. I mean, we could, but it's not right. So we did education. We said, look, you know, we're in a position to fight back against this horrible stuff that's happening to everybody. You know, we can do this. We can lead this. We can be a model. You know, do you think that other people deserve to retire with dignity? Yes, we do. Do you think other people should get health benefits? Yes, we do. Well, that's our goal. We're going to be the model. We're going to be the people that are going to fight for this. And then, and the community like got very involved with that because we didn't say we're just fighting for pension and benefits. And it was something that when the media came and interviewed nurses, they repeated that mantra. And I think that if we can develop these kinds of relationships in a position of strength that we're in to do that, other unions can follow as well around what are the issues, you know, identify what are the things that the community is going to care about. You know, I, I don't, I, you know better than me in your union what that might be and how that might be. But you also have people who are so under attack, they're much more militant naturally than <coughs> fighting for their lives. You know, you just have to motivate people to say, listen, we don't have to take this. You know, because it's just like with lives, they're going to close the hospital, oh well. You know, well, they're going to take away the pension, they're doing it everywhere, oh well. Everybody's paying for health benefits, oh well. You know, no, we're not. You know, it's like the no, we're not and at different levels. Because when people, the, the reason the Lynch Long Island College Hospital was so successful is people, the hospitals were closed, people were going to lose their jobs. There was an emotional attack. There was a whole big thing there. So people, people were ready to fight that. Um, at other levels, that? people are less ready. Oh, if you'll excuse me, I'm yeah. going to jump in because we had a couple more people and we've only got about a minute oh, late, or maybe not even a minute. So how about this question here and then might be all we can do. Um, thank you both. I, my question, you both described really um, dramatic and traumatic changes in your unions, and I'm just wondering how you, both individually and collectively as a union, dealt with the trauma that comes from such a, a dramatic change, and how you repaired those those feelings, those emotions, those kind of structure, and and for yourself personally to keep to be able to keep working and fighting. In your that's, 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 we have an incredible <laughs> team of people, number one, that has been doing this since the 80s in terms of struggle, that trust each other. It's like family, right? And, and just the satisfaction of helping people change their lives. You know, people that really appreciate it and are willing to fight for it, right? That's, that's how I got power into it. Yeah, collective support. Excellent. Thank you so much for a wonderful day.